Iconic American actor and martial artist Chuck Norris has dealt with some of the worst tragedies life can throw at you, like losing loved ones from childhood to adulthood at the age of 80. Let's see how he overcame it all. Troubled birth. Today, Chuck Norris is now over 80, and how he lives is sad. But let's go back to the day he was born. His life faced trouble even on this first day. Wilma Norris, Chuck Norris's mother, was a mere 18 years old when she went through a grueling seven-day labor to bring Chuck into the world. Starting the hospital visit on Sunday, March 3rd, Chuck didn't arrive until the following Sunday. The challenging delivery raised concerns among the medical team multiple times, fearing for the lives of both Wilma and Chuck. Eventually, in the early hours of March 10th, 1940, Chuck weighed in at 6 pounds, 8 ounces. However, there was an immediate worry as something seemed off. Chuck's skin had an unnatural bluish-purple tint. Chuck's father, Ray Norris, was present in the delivery room along with both grandmothers. Witnessing Chuck's unusual color, Ray was so disturbed that he fainted right there. While the medical staff wasn't too worried about Ray, they were extremely concerned about Chuck, recognizing him as a blue baby, signifying a delay in breathing after birth, resulting in the disconcerting skin color. Swift action was necessary to save Chuck's life and prevent potential brain damage due to oxygen deprivation. The doctors promptly administered oxygen to kickstart Chuck's lungs, successfully enabling him to breathe. Despite the success, the doctors remained uncertain about Chuck's survival during the initial five days of his life. He was kept in an isolation unit, similar to today's neonatal intensive care units, to avoid contamination and allow close monitoring. Too weak to feed conventionally, Chuck received expressed milk from his mom through an eyedropper. In a weakened state, Wilma was not allowed to visit Chuck during this period. Wilma possessed a letter from Chuck's grandmother dated that week, expressing doubts about Chuck's chances of survival. To everyone's surprise, Chuck and his mom persevered. They pulled through, and the doctors eventually discharged them. Recounting the experience, Wilma told Chuck that from the moment she saw him, she believed that God had plans for Chuck. This message was reiterated throughout Chuck's life. His father went missing in action. Born in Ryan, Oklahoma, Chuck Norris entered the world as the eldest son of Wilma and Ray D. Norris. His father, a World War II Army soldier, served various roles as a mechanic, bus driver, and truck driver. Chuck had two younger brothers, Wyland and Aaron. Describing his early years, Chuck reflected on a less-than-ideal childhood. He considered himself non-athletic, shy, and academically average, recalling being the reserved kid who struggled to excel in school. Despite the challenges, Chuck was surrounded by a loving family, particularly his mother who harbored dreams of nurturing an average American family. However, his father had a different outlook. Dealing with alcoholism, Chuck's father gradually faded from his life after his parents divorced, but long before that divorce, Chuck and his family would have to deal with the troubles that came with his father. Ray D. Norris, Chuck's father, was drafted into the army during World War II, leading him to the front lines against the Nazis in Germany. Chuck vividly recalled a moment during his father's service when a young boy on a bicycle delivered a telegram from the War Department. The news was devastating. Ray was missing in action. At a young age, Chuck couldn't grasp the full impact of the term missing in action, but the reactions of his mother and grandmother indicated that his father might not return home anytime soon, or perhaps never. For an agonizing three months, the family received no updates. Finally, relief came with the news that Ray was alive. He had been shot in the leg and narrowly escaped being buried alive in a German foxhole, leading to his separation from his unit. Recovering in a military hospital in Texas, Ray's return home was anticipated within two months. While the family rejoiced at Ray's return to the USA, the joy was tempered by the worsening of his pre-existing drinking problem. The ordeal of war seemed to have exacerbated his struggles with alcohol, presenting a new challenge for the reunited family. Troublesome father. Chuck Norris's most challenging and perplexing relationship during his upbringing was with his father. Despite the difficulties, one positive memory lingers, being carried by his father to the Red River, where they spent a day fishing and talking. It's an image that, when recalled, resembles scenes from a movie, 
portraying a perfect father-son moment on a riverbank with fishing lines cast over shimmering water. However, the perfection dissolved when after returning home with the day's catch, his father headed straight to the local beer joint, returning much later that night in a drunken state. Although Chuck acknowledged his father as generally good when sober, those sober days were diminishing. Inebriation would transform him, and trivial matters could trigger abusive rages. The sound of water running during his hangovers, for instance, would lead to explosive outbursts, with threats and expletives echoing through the house. As his mother tried to pacify him, Chuck and his brother Wheeland sought refuge in their bedroom, witnessing the havoc caused by the demon residing in the bottle. On one unfortunate night, Chuck's father, along with Uncle Buck, sought money for a drinking spree. Uncle Buck suggested to borrow some from Chuck's mother, Wilma. Left with only $5 to purchase food for Chuck and his brother, Wilma, refused to surrender it. Uncle Buck, persisting, encouraged his father to resort to violence. In the face of the coercion, Chuck's mother stood firm, calmly asserting that the money was for the children's food. Uncle Buck, pressing further, urged Chuck's father to strike her. Despite the threat, Chuck's mother, standing at five foot, two inches, remained unflinching, looking his father in the eyes and warning him of the consequences. In response, his father and Uncle Buck left the house empty-handed, without the five dollars intended for food. Chuck Norris looked back on his dad's actions and saw he didn't act like a good leader. His dad avoided his responsibilities by drinking a lot, missing the chance to show Chuck and his brothers what a good dad should be. Chuck thought dads are supposed to be like the Almighty, reflecting love and compassion to their kids. But his dad didn't get that. Chuck believed that fathers have a big role in teaching their kids about God. They're like the first teachers kids have, even more critical than regular school. Chuck learned a lot about power from his dad's mistakes. His dad didn't use power well, and Chuck noticed that. Sadly, his dad wasn't the only one. Many dads in society also neglect their duties, according to Chuck. Chuck learned more from what his father didn't do than what he did. Chuck saw his dad's problems as lessons in what not to do. His dad's wrong use of power taught Chuck how to use it right. This was common in society, with many dads not doing their important jobs. So for Chuck, it wasn't just his dad's problem. It was a bigger issue in many families, but things would get much worse before they got better for Chuck and his family. A drunk driving incident. Chuck Norris's father acquired a car, leading to the family's move to Cyril, Oklahoma, where his father secured a job as a truck driver. Their residence was a small room above a restaurant where Chuck's mother worked as a waitress. After about eight months in Cyril, Chuck's father arrived home one night inebriated and announced an immediate departure, just telling the family to get packed. Despite Chuck's mother's plea to wait until morning, he insisted on driving to Wilson right away. Wilma couldn't drive, so it was up to Chuck's drunk father to take the wheel. Chuck and his brother fashioned a bed in the back seat on top of stacked clothes. Under the influence and swerving on the road, Chuck's father disregarded his wife's tearful pleas for safety. He demanded silence, threatening to leave them in the desert. After relentless pleading from Chuck's mother, he eventually returned them to Granny Scarberries in Wilson, Oklahoma. This pattern persisted in their lives. Chuck's father arriving home drunk, engaging in verbal abuse, and Chuck's mother imploring him to stop until he passes out. The apologies and promises to improve followed when he sobered up the next morning, but they remained unfulfilled. Chuck's family struggled financially. After school, Chuck scoured Wilson's streets and highways, collecting pop bottles to return to the grocery store. The grocer paid two cents for regular bottles and five cents for 32 ounce ones. Chuck also gathered scrap iron, earning a penny per pound. Every penny he earned was handed over to his mother to contribute to putting food on the table. One of Chuck's most anticipated activities was heading to the movie theater in Wilson. If his mother could spare a dime, he'd spend entire Saturday afternoons absorbed in the double features, serials, documentaries, and cartoons preceding the main movies. These Saturdays provided a cherished escape into another world. The westerns with icons like John Wayne, Gene Autry, and Roy Rogers 
were a great source of positive role models for Chuck, showing him how to be a good person. Aside from his mother and granny, these cowboy heroes on the screen became his primary role models. Exiting the theater each time, Chuck felt invigorated by the belief in the existence of such men, aspiring to grow up emulating them. These cowboy heroes adhered to the code of the West. These were principles of loyalty, friendship, and integrity. Their selfless actions, doing what was right even when facing significant risks, left a lasting impact on Chuck. In later years, he drew on these Western heroes as he shaped the character he wanted to portray as an actor. As a boy, though, he remained a mere spectator caught up in an adventure. On the other hand, Chuck's father was a negative role model, embodying traits he sought to avoid. Chuck's mother was a symbol of love and care, compensating for his father's deficiencies. Despite the hardships, she maintained an unwavering faith in God, ensuring her sons were brought up with the same conviction and regularly attended church. Her resilience and nurturing nature left a lasting impression on Chuck, overshadowing the negative example set by his father. Chuck's fascination with the cowboy heroes wasn't just a fleeting childhood infatuation. It laid the foundation for his later choices and career path. These on-screen figures instilled in him a set of values that would guide his actions and decisions as he navigated through life. The impact of those Saturday afternoons in the movie theater lingered, shaping Chuck's aspirations and character far beyond his early years in Wilson. In March 1951, Chuck's mother discovered she was pregnant, and his father disappeared once again. Chuck's mom tried to reassure him and his brother Wyland, saying things would improve when their father returned. At 11 years old, Chuck knew better. Their home wouldn't change as long as his father continued drinking, showing no signs of stopping. His father would return home intoxicated, waking them in the middle of the night to fetch a bottle of Thunderbird wine from the liquor store. Describing his father as a drifter is generous, according to Chuck. He says that a more accurate description would be an alcoholic gypsy. The attic in their house became a repository for his father's discarded bottles, a visual reminder of the parts of their lives he had cast away. Chuck only went up there once and was horrified to see hundreds of empty wine bottles scattered across the floor. This sight stuck to him for the rest of his life, the father's habit of driving while drunk didn't improve. A tragic incident occurred one night when Chuck's father had a severe car accident, resulting in the death of an elderly woman. Arrested and convicted of drunk driving and vehicular manslaughter, he received a six-month sentence at a road camp. Chuck and his mom visited him on weekends, and he seemed healthy and in good spirits. They hoped that the experience, combined with six months of sobriety, would lead him to renounce alcohol for good. Unfortunately, their hopes were crushed when, upon release, he immediately headed to the bar. Chuck reflects on the significant lesson he learned from his father, understanding how to manage power from witnessing its abuse. Recognizing his own flaws, Chuck acknowledges that he's not a saint and has faced challenges in fatherhood, perpetuating certain family curses that haunted him. However, the crucial difference is Chuck's awareness of his shortcomings and his commitment to becoming better, breaking the cycle that gripped his family, his parents' divorce. When Chuck turned 15, his family moved to a somewhat better house in Torrance, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. Unfortunately, his father's behavior at home was becoming increasingly aggressive and abusive toward his mother. One night, Chuck overheard his parents arguing in their bedroom, a thud, his mom screaming, and her subsequent crying prompted him to grab a hammer and rush into the room. He shouted a warning at his father, brandishing the hammer menacingly, though his intoxicated state prevented him from taking the threat too seriously. The following day, Chuck and his mom discussed their situation and concluded it was pointless to continue living with the uncertainty of his father's unpredictable and potentially violent behavior. In his absence one night, they along with Chuck's brothers, packed up what they could and moved in with his aunt and uncle. Chuck's parents divorced in 1956 when Chuck was 16, Wyland 12, and Aaron 4. A year later, Chuck's mom met George Knight, a foreman at Northrop, where she worked. George was not only a gentleman, but also a genuinely caring individual. 
George then asked Wilma for her hand in marriage. On that night, Wilma initiated a conversation with Chuck about George's proposal, asking what Chuck thought about it. Chuck assured her that George would be a fine husband and stepfather, genuinely meaning it. Shortly after that conversation, his mom married George, and despite an initial awkward stage, his stepfather became one of the best things that ever happened to him. Things were starting to look up for Chuck. That is, until his father returned unexpectedly one day. One afternoon, upon Chuck's return from school, he discovered his father in the living room, and the sound of his mother crying emanated from her bedroom. His father claimed to be there to take care of George. Chuck objected, stating that his father was not going to harm George, a gentleman who was no match for his father. Gesturing toward the door, Chuck and his father went out to the front yard, ready to square off in a fight. Whether his father saw fear or determination in Chuck's eyes, after a tense moment, his expression changed. His father declared that he wasn't going to fight with Chuck, his voice still surly but with a sigh of resignation. He got into his car and drove off. Facing his father that day in the living room, Chuck learned another crucial lesson about fear. True courage is not the absence of fear, but the control of it. Had Chuck not confronted his father at that moment, who knows what would have happened. But that would be the second last time Chuck would ever see his father. The death of his brother. Military service marked a significant turning point in Chuck's life. Enlisting in the U.S. Air Force proved to be transformative, shaping his future in ways he hadn't anticipated. However, the most challenging ordeal of his life occurred after returning home. Joining the United States Air Force as an air policeman in 1958, Chuck was stationed at Osun Air Base in South Korea. It was during this time that he earned the nickname Chuck and commenced his training in Tang Soo Do, eventually obtaining black belts in the martial arts and founding the Chun Kuk Do form, which means universal way in English. Upon his return from the Air Force, Chuck began teaching martial arts to neighborhood kids in his backyard. His younger brothers, Wieland and Aaron, joined these informal lessons, gaining popularity in the Norris's neighborhood. At the same time, Chuck was employed at Northrop Aircraft. However, the paths of his brothers diverged as they grew older. Aaron, the youngest brother, enlisted in the military and was deployed to Korea. Wieland, the middle Norris sibling, went to Vietnam. When he was 12, Wieland shared with Chuck the unsettling premonition that he wouldn't live past the age of 28, a premonition that tragically manifested in the year 1970. The devastating news reached Chuck during a tournament in California. An announcement over the loudspeaker urgently summoned him to the phone. Answering, he heard the tearful voice of his mother-in-law delivering the heart-wrenching news of Wieland's death in Vietnam. The impact of this news was like being struck by a dozen karate champions simultaneously. Staggering back from the phone, Chuck felt the weight of Evelyn's words sinking in. In a daze, he hung up the phone and sat in shock, grappling with the reality that he would never see his younger brother, his best friend, again in this life. Wieland, who had once foreseen his untimely demise, lost his life on June 3, 1970. This was only one month before his 28th birthday. Chuck later learned that Wieland had been leading his squad through perilous enemy territory when he spotted an enemy patrol setting a trap. In an attempt to warn his men, Wieland was tragically cut down by the Viet Cong. Before we move on, it's time for today's subscriber pick. Chuck Norris is now over 80, and the way he lives is sad. Over the years, his public appearances have become less and less common. No thanks in part due to his dwindling vitality. One of our subscribers recently shared a photo of him, and we can't help but sympathize with the man. There have been rumors that Chuck Norris's health has been declining for the past few years. Yet due to his demands for privacy, none of these stories see the light of day. This is one of many photos that showcase his current state, but we still don't know enough. So this is where you, the viewer, come in. Comment down below if you know anything about Chuck Norris's health and the rumors surrounding his illness. Is he going to be okay, or should we be worried about him? Remember to use the hashtag subscriberpick to let us know your answers.
Now let's move on to the next chapter of Chuck's story, his relationship with Diane Holchek. While Chuck's family life witnessed ups and downs, his romantic life would be the same. When Diane Holchek entered into a relationship with Chuck Norris, both of them were in their teenage years. In his junior year, Chuck Norris encountered a girl named Diane Holchek, a popular and lively beauty with brown eyes, according to him. Despite seeing her often on campus, Chuck was initially too shy to approach her. A turning point occurred while he was working at Boys Market, and Diane entered the store. Though Chuck pretended not to notice, Diane sought his help finding a grocery item, sparking a conversation. Smitten, Chuck gathered the courage to ask her out, and they became a couple, staying steady throughout his final year of high school. Joining the Air Force after high school, Chuck immersed himself in military life for the next few months. The demanding workouts and training didn't bother him. Instead, he embraced the physical improvements, which boosted his self-worth and confidence. Feeling positive about these changes, Chuck decided to propose to Diane. He popped the question in a letter, and Diane joyfully accepted. On leave four months later, Chuck and Diane married in a simple, traditional ceremony in Torrance, California. Chuck donned his Air Force uniform, and Diane looked radiant in her wedding gown. At the time of their marriage, Chuck was 18, and Diane had just turned 17. After a four-day honeymoon in Big Bear, California, Diane joined Chuck Norris in Arizona. They initially set up a house in a 12-foot-long trailer without a bathroom, later upgrading to an apartment with real plumbing, which felt like a luxury. Chuck was stationed at an Arizona base for a year, and Diane stayed with him. However, his subsequent transfer to Osan, Korea, at the age of 19, left him separated from his wife, stepping into an uncertain future. For civilians unfamiliar with military life, it's challenging to grasp the toll extended service can take on a young married couple, according to Chuck. Military life poses difficulties for a family, and the strain intensifies when couples are separated by continents for prolonged periods. After coming back to America, reconnecting with Diane proved more challenging than Chuck anticipated. Having married at a young age and being apart for over a year while Chuck was in Korea, both had changed and matured in different ways. Communication through mail during his absence didn't fully prepare them for the stress of resuming daily life together. The physical separation had led to a growing emotional distance in their relationship. Despite the challenges, they were determined to preserve their marriage. Consciously working on restoring their relationship, they began the process of getting to know each other again. It wasn't easy, but they navigated the readjustment period and emerged stronger. Chuck attributes part of his commitment to the perseverance instilled through his training in Tang Soo Do. Throughout their marriage, Chuck Norris and Diane Holchek welcomed two sons, Michael R. Norris and Eric, who are now grown and thriving, divorce and an illegitimate daughter. Despite their efforts, by 1972, Diane and Chuck found their interests diverging, signaling trouble for their relationship. Increased arguments left both unhappy, leading to a separation where Diane took their sons. Chuck was devastated, sinking into depression as he grappled with the void left in his life. Despite the loneliness and misery, he was determined to pick himself up and move forward. They attempted to reconcile, and it worked for a few years before ultimately reaching its end in divorce. After 30 years of marriage, Chuck Norris and Diane Holchek divorced in 1989, officially separating in 1988 during the filming of the Delta Force II. The reason behind the divorce was Chuck Norris's extramarital affair with Joanna, despite being married to his longtime friend, Diane. The revelation of this infidelity led to their separation. Despite some bitterness in their relationship, they reconciled after three months, mainly for the sake of their sons. However, certain behaviors are hard to change, and Chuck found himself involved in another extramarital relationship, this time with a woman named Gina O'Kelly. This extramarital affair brought further misunderstandings, leading to the couple's decision to cut ties. In 1989, after three decades together, Chuck Norris and Diane Holchek chose to divorce. Despite their son's efforts to resolve the issues between their parents this time, they were unsuccessful. Reflecting on his first marriage's end, Chuck Norris expressed devastation 
describing divorce as a shock to his system. He struggled with the emotional weight of failure and the abrupt shift to a new lifestyle. Accustomed to being cared for by strong, wonderful women all his life, he faced a significant adjustment. Chuck Norris experienced a life-altering moment when he received a letter from Diana Desioli, revealing she was his daughter. Her mother, Johanna, had a brief encounter with Norris during his military service, emphasizing that he never explicitly mentioned his marital status. Johanna initially discouraged Diana from reaching out, fearing it would harm Norris's marriage. However, with news of his divorce, Diana decided to make contact. Norris immediately recognized Diana as his daughter upon seeing her. He grappled with the impact of his actions, considering extramarital affairs a definite sin according to his faith. The weight of the sin and guilt for not being there for his daughter and her mother weighed heavily on him. Norris sought forgiveness from Johanna, acknowledging his extended family as a blessing but continuing to regret the lost years he could have spent with his daughter. His wife almost died. By 2017, Chuck Norris's fans noticed his retreat from the limelight, and he explained that his focus had shifted to his wife Gina's health. The couple collaborated to raise awareness about the dangers of magnetic resonance imaging contrast agents. Gina O'Kelly underwent a magnetic resonance imaging scan to assess the risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. Following the test, she experienced a range of symptoms, including tremors, numbness, and difficulties with cognition. Gina ended up in the emergency room multiple times, spending months in the hospital and accumulating $2 million in medical bills. The expenses covered treatments for her central nervous system and trips to China for stem cell therapies. Having a partner who stands steadfast in moments of darkness is a rare gift. Gina O'Kelly experienced such unwavering support during her health scare. Chuck Norris and Gina O'Kelly were married in 1998 and are parents to twins Danny Kelly Norris and Dakota Allen Norris. Chuck Norris is a father of five. Recalling the fearful moments, Norris expressed the intensity of the situation, stating that his wife was dying right in front of him. He emphasized that the concern extended beyond his wife to others diagnosed with illnesses linked to gadolinium deposition disease. Initially filing a $10 million lawsuit against the manufacturers of the dye responsible for her illness, the lawsuit was later withdrawn voluntarily and no settlement was reached. An expert committee concluded there wasn't sufficient evidence to prove harm to those with normal kidney function due to the chemical element. Nonetheless, the claims prompted action, leading the European Medicines Agency to remove three gadolinium-based contrasts from the market as a precautionary measure. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.